That's Jamie. That's his fault. Okay. I did that one time. <laughs> <laughs> I learned my lesson. Okay, I think we're on, huh? We're on. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradox class. It's really good to have everyone here. And um, Hugh, do you or Mark, do we have questions left over from last week? Or Hugh, do you are you just going to go ahead and uh, and start? Or what are we doing here? Well, we've already started. We got uh, you know twenty five people have already jumped in, so no left over running. We okay. have, we'll be doing original from this morning. Okay. Well, good. Well, Hugh, what do you uh, what do you want us to know this morning? Oh, uh, well, the first fifty minutes are going to be for Q and A, so Q and A okay. is open. Well, there we go. We got a couple of questions already. Okay. All right, we'll start with a question from Stephen Posta in Spring, Texas. Is the concept of all humans having a guardian angel assigned to them a biblical? If so, what scriptures support that? Yeah, a lot of people say that, and uh, there are instances uh, where Jesus talks about, hey, uh, be careful about abusing young children because uh, their angels are watching over them. So that's usually the text that people go to. Um, that doesn't guarantee that every human being has a guardian angel. It is saying that some do, and particularly those that are, uh, you know, uh, young or very weak. Uh, so God does have angels that will protect people that are particularly vulnerable. So, yeah, I wouldn't say there's a guarantee, uh, but also what you see in Hebrews 13 too, many of us have entertained angels that have not been aware of it. So, and usually you get two abuses within the Christian community. People think angels are not involved at all, and others that think they're everywhere. I think it's somewhere in between. You know, people say, well, how many angels does God have? Well, the book of Revelation talks about uh, a myriad of myriad, uh, which is 10,000 times 10,000. So we know God's got at least 100 million, but he could have many, many more. It doesn't give us the number, but it does say it's at least 100 million. Good. Um, our friend uh, Doug has a question. He says, good morning. Are there any verses that instruct the apostles and or other biblical authors of the New Testament to write down what they wrote for the world to see. I reached, I searched the Blue Letter Bible and came up with three Old Testament verses for individual books of the Old Testament, Exodus 34, Habakkuk 2, Ezekiel 43. Or are we to rely solely on the proclamations and criteria of the creeds of the early church leaders? Okay, I'm not quite sure where Doug is going on that, but I'll take a stab at it. You know, do the New Testament authors uh, cite and quote from the Old Testament? They certainly do. They do that uh, multiple times. Jesus did it as well in the Gospels. We need to realize that uh, they had scripture without chapters and verses. And so if you wonder why they say somewhere right. it says, it's because they didn't have a Bible organized like we do. Uh, but what was remarkable to me is how well they knew their Old Testament, because they could pull a statement out of that. Uh, so, um, and also recognize that sometimes it doesn't look exactly like what you see in the Old Testament Hebrew, because uh, typically uh, they were quoting from the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Hebrew original. And why they were doing that? It's because the people they were addressing uh, weren't fluent in Hebrew, but were fluent in Greek. And so it'd be kind of like uh, us today. Uh, we read from the English Bible, but we recognize, hey, that there's a Hebrew original. You know, Hugh, just as a side note on that, I heard Jordan Peterson refer to a, there's a chart out there on the internet that shows all the linkages in the biblical text. And it's, he calls it the first hypertext book ever written. And this thing has like thousands of them, thousands of linkages between all the different chapters of the Bible. I found it one day. I used it in a talk I did. And if anybody's interested, it's really, really worth seeing visually. It's beautiful. And it. Well, uh, this just got published. It's uh, an NIV Bible that just came out from Zondervan. Uh -huh. And, uh, 
it, it kind of does that in print uh, where you have all the cross references for every passage in the Bible. Yeah. And yeah, what they told me is they've got an electronic version where it's hyperlinked. You just hit it and it goes straight to it. You get to it right away. But uh, they also have it in written form. And yeah. you know, this isn't the first cross reference Bible. They've been around a long time, but this is the most exhaustive one uh, that I've been able to find. And I was lucky. I went to the Evangelical Theological Society meeting and one of the meetings there, Zondervan was handing these out for free. Wow. So I got this for free. But I've been found it very helpful, uh, you know, just in terms of uh, my biblical research. Very good. We have a question from uh, Tom. Is it D E Y or O E Y? I'm sorry, Tom, if I'm getting that wrong. Um, Dr. Ross, I have enjoyed watching your series on human origins in the paradox class recorded in 2020. You mentioned you were writing a new book on the biblical flood. Could you update us on the status of your research on this topic, please? Is there any ice core evidence of a warming phenomenon during the last ice age or other scientific evidence of conditions that occasioned a biblical flood? Thank you. Yeah, very good. I mean, at that time, uh, the book I was slated to write next was a book on the Genesis flood. What happened a few months after I gave that talk is that uh, they said, look, we want you to write a book on dual origins. So that's the book I'm working on right now. I've got a lot of research background, the flood book. That flood book will come out after I'm done uh, with the uh, book on dual revelations. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, and answering his question about ice cores, that's one of the reasons why uh, I believe that the flood of Noah wiped out the entire world of humanity and all the animals associated with them, but it didn't inundate the whole globe because we don't see any evidence of a flood in either the Antarctic ice cores or the Greenland ice cores, or for that matter, even in the ice cores in the Swiss Alps. Uh, so that would tell us that the flood of Noah uh, had to be localized to the region where human beings dwelt. And the thing you notice in Genesis 10 and 11, it wasn't until after the flood that humanity finally began to colonize globally. Before that, they were in one region. Uh, actually had God in Genesis chapter 11 forcibly scattering humanity over the whole face of the earth. Uh, the motivation of humans at that time is we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to stay in one place, be one nation with one city, one tower, one people, one language. And God recognized that was a prescription for the rulers of that one nation to oppress their citizens. His goal all along was multiple nations that would be in a free market competition uh, for citizens. So uh, he set that up in chapter 11. Uh, and the wonderful thing I see, too, is the way God designed our seven continents. They're designed in such a way that you've got natural geographical borders, which permits a smaller nation to live beside a large nation uh, without uh, concern that that nation is going to wind up ruling the whole world. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Susan Lambeau says, I am very interested in the 410,000 year span of Cambrian explosion where all 50 to 100 phyla showed up. Did you write about it in any RTB articles or do you have paper links that you could send me? Thank you. Yes, uh, that article will come out as a today's new reason to believe. Uh, in fact, I think it's already come out. I think it came out uh, last Monday. Uh, so uh, you can check that out. I'm also writing a longer piece that's going to be showing up in the, the Selvo magazine. Every quarter, I write a, a fairly long article uh, for this uh, magazine. It's uh, uh, sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church, but it's uh, highly evangelistic. It's targeting young people, and almost all the authors are Protestants. It's like, I find it interesting. Mm -hmm. Roman Catholics want to see people come to Christ. And they're saying, well, we better tap into these Protestant scholars. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I, I have an article in every one of them. I got a fairly long piece there 
on that. And uh, I'll be writing a longer piece, so we'll get posted on our website. Uh, but it's probably going to have to wait until I get a good chunk of this dual revelation book written. Uh, they've shortened up the deadline, so I don't have a lot of time to finish that. Good. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Linnea Nelson asks, can particle physicists view of extreme heat massless particles expanding from a single point, then expanding, cooling, and allowing larger particles with mass, et cetera, to form later, be used to solve the mathematically impossible infinite density problem of Big Bang cosmology, trying to fit all mass of the universe in one point? Yeah, I addressed that issue in Beyond the Cosmos, the third edition, uh, where I talk about how theoretical physicists uh, determined that there had to be more dimensions and length, width, and height, uh, because there's simply not enough room within those three dimensions for all the symmetries required by gravity, uh, by uh, quantum mechanics, and the general relativity. And over a 10-year period, uh, they played with different models and finally determined the universe must have begun with nine dimensions of space, uh, where the universe starts off as an infinitesimally small volume, and then it expands. And uh, so we have all nine dimensions expanding until gravity separates out uh, from the one unified force that happens when the universe is 10 to the minus 43 seconds old. Uh, but it's those extra dimensions of space. And by the way, six of the nine stop expanding at 10 to the minus 43, but they're still here today. And what I describe in Beyond the Cosmos is how a team of theoretical physicists, some of which I know personally, basically showed that you can have massless particles uh, in six dimensions of space and how they're kind of like infinitesimal black holes. And so you can actually have a black hole with no mass if you got six dimensions of space and basically make the point is that we now know that particles should not be thought of as points, uh, but rather something different. And, uh, and you know, these six dimensions, extra dimensions, uh, they're still here today. Uh, and they're no bigger than what they were when the universe was 10 to the minus 43 seconds old. But what's wonderful about this nine dimensional concept of the universe, it explains how the particles can all have the properties that they do in a way that's consistent with a cosmic creation model. Because that was a challenge for several decades. How do we integrate our particle creation model with our cosmic creation model? And the only way is if you bring in these six extra dimensions of space, where six of them stop expanding at a certain point in the history of the universe. If you want to read the details, get the third edition of The Crater and the Cosmos, and anyone can get a free uh, chapter of that book at reasons.org uh, slash Ross. And by the way, that's the only science chapter in the book is chapter three. It's a fairly long chapter. And I tell people, hey, if you're willing to take my word for all my claims here, you can skip through uh, all the, the quantum gravity stuff and you know, string theory stuff, and they'll just go to chapter four and they keep on going with the theological points that the book makes. But hey, a lot of people really love that stuff. So it's all there in chapter three. Very good. Well, Hugh, it's 1045. We can pick these questions up again after. Do you want to go ahead and start your teaching? Yeah, we'll start. Let me begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we have the privilege of living here on planet Earth in the 21st century. You've given us the book of scripture. You've given us the book of nature. But we live at a time, as it says in the book of Daniel, where knowledge is exploding. And Father, we're grateful to be here at a time when there's so much being added uh, to your book of nature. And Father, I pray that you would give us the humility and the wisdom to be able to take what you're revealing to us in these last days in the book of nature to give us uh, evidence for the truth and reliability of the book of scripture and use that as a tool to build uh, your life within us, but also to uh, share with people who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, that there really is a book that you've given us, a book that we can trust implicitly, 
and it'll show us the way that we can experience an eternal loving relationship uh, with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'll give a little bit of an outline. Um, you know, every alternate week, uh, I bring in a new scientific discovery, kind of what we've been talking about. Every day, scientific research papers are being published that give us a stronger case for the Christian faith. So I've got a couple of discoveries I'm going to share with you this morning, and hopefully we'll have time also to jump into our lesson, where I'm going to talk about the origin of the scientific method, how it actually comes from the pages of Scripture. Last week, we went through the entire Bible and looked at all the places where it commands us to put everything to the test. And so this week, I want to actually get into, okay, how does the Bible tell us to put things to the test? and how that was really the birth of the, the scientific method. Uh, and last week, uh, we shortened up the webinar and extended the web meeting. And I got really good feedback on that. People like that. So I'm going to try it again today so that uh, when I'm finished with the teaching time, I will go into a web meeting uh, where we can ask questions. So instead of having the Q&A time as part of the webinar, We'll make it part of the web meeting. But I got some good feedback last week saying, hey, there's those of us who really don't want to turn on our cameras and turn on our microphones. Uh, and I said, we're going to let you do that. When you get into the web meeting, if you want to turn on your camera and microphone, please do that. If you want to ask your questions verbally, please do that. But hey, for those of you who love the webinar format, uh, where you just have the cameras off, the microphone off, and put your questions in the chat feature, uh, we're going to let you do that too. And so, and also people said they would really like a little more time on the Q&A. So last week we alternated uh, between a short testimony uh, from one of you uh, that's in the class uh, to a question. Uh, I think what we're going to try this week, and again, I really appreciate the feedback you're giving me on this. I want to make these virtual classes as uh, productive and enjoyable as possible. And the suggestion I got was, how about this? Uh, answer a question from the chat, answer a question from somebody who's got their microphone and camera on, and then have someone uh, give uh, one of your assigned uh, short testimony stories. And so that means two questions for every story. So that's what we'll do in the web meeting. Uh, so uh, when I'm done with the teaching, I'll kind of set that up for you. Uh, so that uh, uh, you can move from the webinar to the web meeting. It's not automatic, uh, so uh, I'll give you some instructions on how all that uh, works. Okay, uh, what I want to do now is share screen so that you can see my visuals. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is working. This is great. And uh, let me set up my second computer. I forgot to do that before the class. Here we go. And while you're looking at this, this again is just a reminder. I do take questions on Facebook and Twitter. Although I'm getting to the point where I'm not sure I'm going to be able to keep up with them all, but I'm going to do my best. Here we go on computer number two. That's one thing I'm looking forward to when we have our in-person meetings. I'm gonna be able to run the class with just one computer, uh, which means I won't have to pay attention to two computers. And just again, uh, you can get a free chapter of this book, More Than a Theory, which is basically a quick summary of the Biblical testable creation model we've developed with reasons to believe. And uh, this is a docudrama we've done in Dual Revelation, uh, where we interview people, scientists and theologians on this subject of God revealing it to us faithfully through two books. This is the web uh, URL you're going to need to get into the web meeting. I'll put this up again just before we end the webinar and go to the web meeting. 
Uh, and this is, by the way, is the same address we've been using for the past several months. And if you ever forget, it's always posted at paradoxes.org. So you can always go there and uh, get in uh, that way. Uh, but the scientific discovery I want to talk about is the origin of the oxygen that made possible the uh, Avalon explosion of animals and the one that followed it soon thereafter that made possible the Cambrian explosion of animals. Uh, we discussed this uh, in the past uh, weeks about uh, the new discoveries that show that the Cambrian explosion is far more explosive. The fact that it all happened in 410,000 years and how they found a new phylum that they thought showed up later, in fact, shows up at the very beginning of the Cambrian explosion. And uh, yeah, just a quick announcement. When we do get to our web meeting, uh, the spiritual conversation testimonies I'm going to have you share is simply tell us about your most recent meaningful spiritual conversation. And by the way, we're going to hold you down to a couple of minutes. So i uh, try to abbreviate it down to a couple of minutes, but you can be thinking about that uh, when we get to our web meeting. And I'll announce that again. Okay. Uh, what has been almost completely resolved is we now have an understanding where the oxygen came from. It's been known for some time that there was a sudden jump in uh, atmospheric oxygen from less than 1%, uh, you know, 600 million years ago, and it jumped up suddenly uh, to 8%. Uh, and that brought about the Avalon explosion of animals. And then later we have uh, the oxygen jumping from 8% up to 10%. And so I'll start off with the dates. Uh, the Eddicarian oxygenation event. Uh, that's where the oxygen jumped from less than 1% up to 8%. Uh, the date for that is 579 to 575 million years ago. Uh, the error bars are such that we can't pin down a precise date. And it's possible that a number of phenomena uh, would cause it to be extended maybe over the entirety of the 4 million uh, years. And uh, the significant point there is when the oxygen is less than 1%, it really restrains life on planet Earth to microbial life. Uh, but when you got up to 8%, you now have sufficient oxygen in the atmosphere that it's possible to have uh, animals and animals of significant size. Animals of significant size, nevertheless, uh, they must be uh, relatively simple. And so this is the most complex of the uh, Avalon explosion creatures. You do see some bilateral symmetry. So it shows up for the first time in the Avalon explosion. Uh, but this is a filter feeding creature uh, where it's uh, about a half a meter across. So no longer we talk of microbial life, these creatures are of a significant size. Uh, if you want to know the name of it, it's Dixonia uh, cost costata, and it ranks as the most complex of the Eddicarian animals. Well, like all Eddicarian animals, there's no digestive tract. They're basically filter feeders. There's no circulatory system, uh, and uh, you don't have internal or external uh, organs. There's simply not enough oxygen in the atmosphere to support an animal any more complex than this. Uh, but the big story is, uh, where did all this oxygen come from and how come it shows up so suddenly? And we now know there are four different factors working together that explain the jump of oxygen. So this is the new discovery. And the first insight is what's called the gas gears deglaciation. And this is the third of three snowball events that happened from 650 million years ago. The last one was a gas gears deglaciation. And that, uh, that's where you have this uh, big snowball event. The snowball event is where you got at least 80% of the surface of the earth covered with thick ice. But in the case of the gas gears deglaciation, that ice melted very quickly. And so the rapid melting of thousands of feet of ice covering 80% of the globe uh, 
delivered huge amounts of phosphorus and other nutrients into the oceans. And that ignited an exponential growth of marine photosynthetic organisms. So instead of having just a few of these photosynthetic organisms, uh, we now had a huge abundance and they began to pump out enormous amounts of oxygen uh, into uh, the atmosphere. And yeah, because the deglaciation was so extreme and so rapid, uh, we had this huge delivery of uh, phosphorus and nutrients off the continents being dumped in the oceans. And that's what ignited uh, this explosion. The photosynthetic organisms uh, were microscopic, <coughs> but we're talking literally quadrillions and quadrillions of them. And so uh, that was a major contribution uh, to pushing the oxygen content up. But there is a second geological contributor. <coughs> and uh, this contributor was uh, the great unconformity. And we don't have a good date for the great unconformity somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 million years, but we're talking an error bar of almost 50 million years on this. And it's a worldwide upheaval of continents that caused massive landslides onto the continental shelves, delivering nutrients and creating vast shallow water continental shelves, which multiplied marine photosynthetic life. So we're talking about these uh, shallow uh, seas existing off of the continental uh, borders and, uh, <coughs> and those shallow seas meant that you could have photosynthetic life at a significant uh, uh, volumes uh, over that area and likely initiated by the breakup of Rodinia. Now, a lot of you have probably heard of Pangaea. That's the supercontinent that existed a quarter of a, a billion years ago and is now broken up to where we've got the seven continents on the face of the earth. And uh, the red improbable planet, I talked there about the supercontinent cycle, about how every five or 600 million years, we go through a cycle of the continents coming together and making one supercontinent, then that supercontinent splitting up and getting multiple continents. Uh, Rodinia is a supercontinent that existed in the cycle just before uh, Pangaea. And here's a map about what it looked like uh, when it was a single supercontinent. And uh, you can see there how scientists have tried to figure out, okay, well, where are the continents we see today uh, in the system? You know, what's interesting there is that uh, the uh, one that shows up the largest, Laurentia, uh, is basically uh, North America and uh, Greenland kind of uh, jammed together. But uh, you can see uh, you know, India, Australia, South China, East Antarctica, et cetera. Uh, you can see uh, Western Europe, Baltica uh, sitting there. Uh, and this is kind of what Rodinia looked like about uh, 800 uh, million years ago. And then just before the Avalon explosion, the supercontinent began to break up. And so here we see it starting to break up. Uh, and it's a breakup of the supercontinent uh, would have which should have caused these massive landslides uh, into the oceans. And uh, this caused a second uh, contribution uh, to the jump of oxygen. But there's two biological factors that also play a role. And that would be uh, the development of fungi lichen colonies on the continents. And you say, well, what's happening there? Well, these fungi lichen colonies, what they do is they basically cover huge areas of land mass on the continents. And by covering that huge land mass, they prevent the oxygen in the atmosphere uh, from oxidizing the underlying uh, regolith. And you may not be familiar with that technical term. Regolith simply refers to broken rocks, pebbles, dust uh, that exists between the organic rich soil of the continents and the bedrock underneath. I mean, uh, where I live uh, here in Southern California, we got a very thin layer of organic rich soil. Underneath that, uh, we've got a couple of inches of a uh, regolith and underneath that we got bedrock. So it explains why I'm always challenged to grow stuff on our property because uh, there's a very thin layer of soil and the bedrock's only inches below. Uh, but that material is between 
the topsoil uh, and the bedrock is what's called the regolith. And uh, if that's exposed, uh, it gets oxidized by the atmospheric oxygen. But the development of these uh, fungi lichen colonies basically prevented, uh, caused a barrier uh, because it was just so thick and pervasive, it prevents the oxygen from making contact with a regolith. And hence, because there is an oxidation going on, that oxygen winds up staying in the atmosphere. Instead of being consumed uh, by the crust of the earth, it stays in the atmosphere. That's probably the most significant biological contributor, but the, the papers that have been published basically point out they've actually found a second biological contributor. And the second biological contributor are small sponges. Now, sponges uh, really become sophisticated and large uh, just before the Cambrian explosion. But just before uh, the Avalon explosion, you've got these microscopic sponges. Some of them are actually as small as 0.01 millimeters, but most of them are around 0.1 millimeters. Uh, that's what you see at the beginning of the Avalon explosion. Then as you move into the uh, Avalon, uh, they do get larger. But the property of sponges is they have a lot of surface area. I mean, if you ever picked up a sponge, uh, you've got all these little holes and crevices. And uh, what that does is greatly increase the surface area on which uh, photosynthetic bacteria and algae uh, can live. So uh, for example, uh, here's uh, a sponge. Uh, this is kind of a blow up of one of these small sponges. But as you look carefully at it, you can see uh, it's got uh, a lot of uh, holes and crevices everywhere. And that all creates additional surface areas on which bacteria uh, and other uh, microscopic algae can exist. And so creating more habitat space uh, for these photosynthetic microbes and uh, very tiny algae species is what enables a lot more oxygen to be pumped uh, into the atmosphere. So four different factors acting together simultaneously explains why you get this sudden jump from less than 1% oxygen to 8% oxygen. And by sudden, we mean within a few million years, we see the oxygen jumping from less than one up to 8%. Now this is significant because uh, when I posted the link uh, to the short article I wrote about the discoveries we talked about a couple of weeks ago about the Cambrian explosion uh, discoveries and how we know it's much more explosive. I got a lot of atheists uh, uh, coming onto my Twitter and Facebook pages saying, hey, uh, we think these species were showing up uh, before the Cambrian event. And likewise, we think these Avalon creatures were showing up before the Cambrian event. And now we have the research that tells us that's simply not even possible because there's not enough oxygen in Earth's atmosphere to permit a previous undiscovered history uh, of these animals. Because that's kind of the argument I'm getting uh, from the non-theists. They're saying, hey, it looks like a sudden and immediate, uh, but it's possible because the fossil record is incomplete that these creatures were showing up earlier. And basically what this new evidence is telling us, that's not possible. It's not in the fossil record because there simply isn't the oxygen to support the possible existence of these creatures. You need a minimum of 8% even for these creatures to possibly exist. And this evidence also is telling us, hey, the dates we get uh, for this sudden jump of oxygen from these four different mechanisms is immediately before we see the first Avalon animals in the fossil record. So it's basically showing us there's not a time delay between the burst of oxygen and the first appearance of these Avalon animals. Well, that's the story for the Avalon explosion. The Avalon explosion's date is 575 million years ago. And we see from 579 to 575, these four mechanisms, two geological and two biological work together uh, to bring the oxygen content up that makes possible these animals. Okay, how about the Cambrian? The Cambrian, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, 
Uh, we now have an accurate date for the first time for the beginning of the Cambrian about 538.6 million years ago. And uh, the error bar on that is less than 410,000 years. And this is when the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere uh, jumped up from 8% to 10%. And the significant factor there is that the Cambrian explosion animals is when for the first time we see animals uh, with a digestive tract, with a circulatory system, where you've got a heart, where you've got a brain, uh, where you've got internal organs, and uh, you've got uh, external organs. And uh, for creatures of that complexity, you need a minimum of 10% oxygen in the atmosphere. And you also need that to get the complex skeletons uh, that these uh, creatures uh, are uh, manifesting. Now, here's what some of these creatures look like. I showed you this a couple of weeks ago. This is actually uh, some fossils I found uh, when I was with a group on Mount Stephen in uh, British Columbia. And uh, you know, some of the rocks I picked up, little, little uh, shale slabs I picked up had over a dozen fossils in them. This one had three uh, wonderfully preserved uh, trilobites. And you say, well, what's the size you're seeing here? Uh, these trilobites are about three to four inches long. Uh, and they were found on Mount Stephen. But probably the most charismatic of the uh, Cambrian animals is this one uh, that uh, is called uh, Op Opabinia, Opabinia. And uh, it's a creature with five eyes. So uh, what you see there, those, those are actually fully functioning eyes. A creature with five eyes. It's the only creature we know of in the fossil record uh, that's got five high functioning eyes. And then you can see that little nose coming out and it's actually got um, a, a kind of like tongs. You ever think about salad tongs? This is a creature uh, that's got clawed tongs and he uses that for capturing prey. And actually uh, this figure you're seeing here doesn't do this creature justice uh, because underneath it, it has all these gills that allows it to process dissolved oxygen uh, from the ocean and use that to maintain high activity. It's got a very complex tail. And so uh, it's kind of, eh, because of the way its body design and its tail structure, it's kind of able to fly through the water. It, kinda, it has the same uh, uh, mechanics that you see in a lot of aircraft. And uh, then we have uh, this creature, and uh, this is a fossil that was found not too far from uh, Mount Stephen. And it's called Wewaxia. And uh, so it's got this body and then it's got these uh, spine-like structures that come out of it. And uh, a number of these fossils have been found in uh, British Columbia. And uh, here's what they think they actually look like. And uh, these are animals uh, that are crawling along the surface of the ocean and are picking up things uh, that they can uh, feed upon. Now, all these fossils have been found relatively close to one another. Uh, Mount Stephen is where you see these segmented worms and uh, different crab-like creatures, and of course the trilobites. Uh, but uh, the Wewaxia creatures were found on some peaks that are actually known as the Wewaxia peaks. And it's in Yoho National Park, and uh, I've actually visited, there's a very beautiful area. It's interesting how the places where these Cambrian animals have been found is in a really a gorgeous part of the world. So these are the Wewaxia peaks uh, where they found fossils of uh, these creatures. And uh, I think I got another photo. Yeah, here we go. Uh, here's another one. In fact, my colleague Ken uh, Holkren at her office, he actually took this photo and turned it into uh, a painting, he loves to paint. And uh, here's one showing uh, Mount Stephen, which is uh, over to the right or over to the left, pardon me. Uh, matter of fact, I think, yeah, there it goes. That's the place uh, we all hiked up to, to see the Cambrian fossils on uh, Mount Stephen. And then uh, we wax the peaks over to the right and what you see in the foreground is the Opabin Plateau. And the Opabin Plateau 
is where they found uh, fossils of these Opabinia uh, creatures. So this whole region of Yoho National Park, they named the different parts of the regions after the different fossils uh, that have been uh, discovered uh, in the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. And here's proof that I was actually there. And uh, here's uh, my wife, Kathy. Uh, she's always up for adventure uh, with me to these different places. And we weren't alone. Uh, we were pretty much alone. We didn't see human beings, but uh, we did see these uh, woolly marmots. It's the second largest rodent in North America, uh, just a little bit smaller than beavers. Uh, this guy weighed in at almost 25 pounds. And these creatures are incredibly engaging. They love human contact. And you say, well, what do they eat? They're not really looking for snacks from us. They feed on lichen. See all the lichen on the rocks there? Uh, and this is a part of the world uh, where uh, you get snow for 10 and a half months of the year. So these uh, creatures, they have to put on enough body fat in six weeks in order to be able to hibernate the other 10 and a half months. And so uh, they scurry around and uh, they feed on the lichen. So you can see all the lichen that's around uh, this creature. And they're just, they're just eating this stuff all day long uh, during the summertime, building up a body fat they need to make it through uh, the winter. Uh, but just like as the case with the Avalon oxygenation event, the Cambrian oxygenation event uh, is a combination of uh, biological features. And this is also in a brand new paper. All this will be cited in an article I got coming out uh, at uh, today's new reason to believe. I put one out every Monday, although I'll give you an advanced tip. Coming in uh, March, I'm gonna be going to putting out an article every two weeks. I have to do that because of the tight deadline I got on my book, Dual Revelation. So it will be a period where I'll only be posting articles every two weeks instead of every week. You could be praying for me because I really want to get back to doing it uh, every week. Uh, but the new discovery is they found that um, towards the end of the Avalon explosion, we begin to see a proliferation of sponges of all sizes, not just small sponges, so sponges of all sizes and also a great diversity of sponges and sponges are filter feeders. And so we have this huge population of sponges, different species, different sizes, and uh, they're removing large amounts of organic carbon from seawater just before the Cambrian explosion event. And evidently there's so many sponges in the seawater at that time that this, the, fee, the filter feeding in these sponges prevents the sinking of organic carbon to the seafloor bottoms. And the prevention of the sinking of that organic carbon limits oxidation. Because typically if a lot of organic carbon sinks to the bottom of the ocean, what that happens is that the dissolved oxygen there at the bottom of the ocean gets consumed uh, by uh, the decay of that organic carbon. And so the prevention of the sinking of organic carbon actually increases the dissolved oxygen in seawater at depths. And recognize this is a time when you've got shallow uh, seawater off of the coasts of the continents around the world. So you've got these huge uh, continental shelves. And so the point is this now allows animal life to exist at the surface and all the way down to the bottom of these uh, shallow seas that exist off the continents. Uh, but in order to make the Avalon or the Cameron explosion possible, it's necessary that we bump up uh, the dissolved oxygen uh, at the uh, floor, sea floors of these shallow seas. Because that's where we really find all these Cambrian animals. Uh, most of them, we do see some that swim in the water, but a lot of them are feeding on the bottom. And uh, so you need enough oxygen there to make that possible. And so that's one contributing factor is you got these sponges uh, soaking up uh, or preventing this carbon from being oxidized. Uh, a second factor is that the sponge microbial symbionts sequestered huge amounts of marine phosphorus 
which prevented the phosphorus from being oxidated and thus also contributed to con increasing the dissolved oxygen in seawater uh, at uh, great depths. Now, this was all proposed in a paper where they said, trying to figure out how we get from 8% to 10%, this is the only way. We don't have a great unconformity. We don't have a, a snowball event. There has to be another explanation for what jumped the oxygen from 8% to 10%. And they said, the only option we see uh, is uh, a vast explosion in sponge uh, abundance and sponge diversity. But they like the proof for that. And this is what's in the latest uh, research. They finally were able to affirm, yes, sponges are the answer uh, to the great increase in oxygen uh, in the uh, continental shelves off of the continents. And the problem is sponges seldom leave behind fossil evidence. They have these little spicules, but the spicules decay very easily. And so trying to find fossil evidence of sponges dating back that far is extremely challenging. And research team said, look, we're never gonna prove this by trying to find the fossils. However, they were able to demonstrate through the research is that sponges manifest a unique uh, silicon isotope ratio. Unique and it's different from any other life form uh, we see on the earth at that time. So they said, all we need to do is uh, go into these uh, Cambrian uh, sediments and especially the earliest of the Cambrian sediments and see if we can determine this uh, silicon isotope uh, ratio that would be indicative of the sponges and see to what extent the silicon isotope ratio shows up. And that will tell us whether or not sponges were super abundant or were not, and also give us some indication of the diversity. And that's kind of the hot news. They were able to make these silicon isotope ratio measurements in the earliest deposits of the, the Cambrian era. And indeed it affirmed that sponges were super abundant at that time and super diverse just before uh, the launch of the Cambrian explosion. So it now confirms that the hypothesis they had that, hey, uh, sponges seem to be the only option we see out there, but we don't have any evidence. Now they got actual uh, physical evidence uh, that uh, this made that all possible. And the silicon isotope ratios affirm that sponges became super abundant and super diverse just before the Cameron explosion. Now, in terms of the Avalon uh, sponges, they were super tiny and not hardly any diversity at all. But once you get into the Cambrian, we see that this very beginning of the Cambrian is that we see sponges of all different kinds. We see them as complex as the sponges that exist on the planet today. So if you've ever been snorkeling in the areas, uh, look for the sponges. Everybody looks for coral, uh, but I've been to places in the world where the abundance of sponges is equal to that of the coral. And so here are a couple of uh, photos uh, showing it. And today, a lot of the sponges we see are what they call pipe sponges. So this is a, a close-up of such a, a pipe a sponge where you get this kind of long column of a, of a sponge material. Uh, but like all sponges, it's uh, lots of holes, uh, lots of channels, canyons, etc which allows all kinds of other life forms to grab on and have a little habitat. And again, uh, to this day, uh, contributes to the oxygenation of uh, the waters. Okay, that's it for the discovery. Let me jump in uh, to where we left off. And uh, you know, last week, uh, we went through the Bible, Old and New Testament, and uh, basically looked at all the places where uh, it exhorts us to test. Some cases just flat out commands us to put everything to the test. But not only tells us to put everything to the test, it basically tells us uh, that we're to hold on to that which proves to be good and true. And that's consistent with the biblical definition for faith. The biblical definition, you'll see four different words used uh, for faith in the Bible, one in Greek and three in Hebrew but they all mean 
acting upon what is established to be true. And so uh, when the Bible commands us to put everything in a test, it's basically saying, do the work of investigation and analysis uh, to see what's true and what is false. But once you determine what is true, uh, act upon it, bring it into your life, adhere to it, uh, put it into practice. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we have 66 books in the Bible. And so it's not enough to take the Bible's creation science text literally. And I believe that all of the Bible's creation science texts are meant to be taken literally, in spite of what I'm seeing in the theological literature, where people claim it's all figurative. It's just not written that way. And so this is where I would agree with my young earth creationist friends. When you look at the biblical creation text, the way it's set up, the grammar, the genre indicates that this is to, meant to be taken literally and historically. However, where I part company with my young earth creationist friends, I also argue we have to integrate all the creation texts in the Bible. And incidentally, this is something I found very attractive about the Bible during my late teenage years. I went through the different books that undergird the world's major religions what attracted me is just how much creation content there is in the Bible and how diverse it is. Where I'd find maybe one text on creation uh, in another uh, religious holy book, uh, two, the most I ever found was three. That's what you see in the uh, Mormon text as well as uh, in the Quran. But I kind of look at Mormonism and uh, Islam as Christian cults. They build on what the Bible, you know, both of them incorporate the Old and New Testament uh, into their faith. And so that to me explains why they have as many as three major texts on creation. But the Bible's got more than two dozen. And this gives us multiple opportunities to test our interpretation, say, of Genesis 1. Let's see how consistent our interpretation is with all the other biblical texts. And so in terms of putting things to the test, we really want to look at all the creation texts. You know, as I remind my young with friends, not all the answers about creation are in Genesis. There's 65 other books of the Bible. And many of them are surprised to learn that there is significant creation content in the other books of the Bible, uh, mainly because I notice in my, in young with creation circles, they really don't pay any attention to the creation content that's in the wisdom books. Uh, namely in Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So the point I'm making is many church splitting controversies would disappear if Christians would integrate all the biblical creation uh, science texts. And if you're wondering about the photo, uh, this was a debate I had with a young earth creationist years ago in the North Carolina, uh, where the audience of 1200 uh, we're entirely young earth creationists, except for my wife and a couple of our reasons to believe volunteers. And uh, you know, here you can see the time. I've only got six minutes to make my points here. So uh, it was a highly time constrained uh, debate. But the point I was making in that debate is, uh, let's look at all the creation texts in the Bible. God gave us 66 books. We should pay attention to all 66 of those books. And if we were to do so, a lot of the things that would divide us in the Christian community, I think would disappear if we were to sit down together and say, okay, let's look at all the context and uh, let's see what happens. Science works the same way. And I see that my time is up. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll get into the science and then we're going to actually see how science, I mean, what's interesting when I talk to my secular peers, they have no idea the degree to which modern day science uh, owes its success to the Bible. So we're gonna be talking about that next week. Next week, I'm not gonna talk about a scientific discovery. We'll jump immediately uh, into this, uh, but actually show uh, how the modern scientific enterprise, the scientific revolution uh, owes uh, a huge debt to the Bible and particularly to uh, what happened during the Reformation. And when I say Reformation, it was both the Protestants and the Roman Catholics that were reformed. There was a Reformation within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, to a much greater degree, there was one uh, amongst uh, the Protestants. 
Uh, but that reformation is really what gave birth to the scientific revolution. And it's because uh, scientists uh, began to read the Bible for themselves. It wasn't just the priest uh, that had the Bibles. The Bibles are now made available to everyone. Anyway, we'll talk about that next week. What I'm going to do is uh, stop the share feature. Ah, no, actually, I'm going to bring up the share feature again, because uh, I want to show this URL again. Ah, sorry. Here we go. So yes, this is the URL. So I'm going to bring the webinar to a close. And uh, we're going to have another Q&A time in the web meeting. It's also a time when we can uh, you know, share our uh, stories. Uh, so, and again, I'll make the announcement. What I'm going to do, when you get into the web meeting, you'll be put into a waiting room. And uh, once you're in that waiting room, just be patient. I have to manually pull all of you uh, from the waiting room into the web meeting. It shouldn't take more than a minute or two. And if you join late, uh, I'll get a notification in your waiting room. Again, just be patient. As soon as I see that, I'll pull you in. Uh, but the way it's going to be structured is that uh, when you get into the web meeting, if you want to, you can turn on your camera and microphone or just turn on your microphone and not your camera. You can leave both off and uh, we will alternate from taking a question from the chat. So if you got a question, feel free to type it into the chat uh, or uh, you can ask a question verbally. So we're gonna alternate from a verbal question. Uh, we'll begin with that, a verbal question. Then we'll go to a chat question. And then if one of you would like to share uh, a testimony about a recent meaningful spiritual conversation you had, either with a Christian or with a non-Christian, uh, we're going to give you a chance to do that, and then we'll go back to taking a verbal question and then a question uh, from the chat. So this is the URL you're going to need to get into the web meeting. Again, if you forget it, it's posted at uh, reasons.org, or pardon me, paradoxes.org, and I think we also put it in the chat feature, so you should be able to see it there. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop the share feature. And I'll bring the uh, meeting uh, to an end here and see all of you in the uh, web uh, meeting.